Hi everyone, and welcome to Liberty Me Live. Welcome back from the Thanksgiving break. We're here tonight with Dick Clark, who is the author of two of our Liberty Guides, uh, Building an Armory from Scratch and How to Buy Your First Handgun, which I'll link in chat in just a moment. Dick Clark first became a firearms enthusiast when he learned to point his finger and say, bang. He grew up in southeastern Louisiana shooting with his father. He taught riflery, shotgunning, and archery at the Salmon Scout Reservation for two summers as a youth staffer and worked in a retail gun store during his time as an undergrad student at Auburn University. Dick now works in public policy in Nebraska, advocating free markets, individual liberty, and personal responsibility. And he also maintains a niche legal practice catering to entrepreneurs in the firearm industry as well as individual gun owners. And he's the editor of silencernews.com. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dick. Thanks, Matt. Uh, it's a great intro. I know I should know because I wrote it. It's wonderful. I really like it. No, but just kidding. Tonight, we're going to talk about a few things, uh, all eventually tying in with guns, but not entirely about guns. Uh, we're going to talk some about gun law, and we're going to talk about uh, trust law, and then uh, policies relating to silencers. But the first and most important thing I have to give you as an attorney is a disclaimer. And uh, that is that none of this is legal advice for your particular situation, just general information. Okay, so disclaimer over with. So most people uh, who are interested in guns anyway are familiar with pistols, rifles, and shotguns. And the regulations, the excuse me, the, the government restrictions on purchasing them and transferring them. And for most of us, uh, in most states, you can't, in the United States anyway, you can go and buy a pistol or rifle or shotgun over the counter, so to speak, maybe with an instant check, uh, maybe with a permit that you've already gotten. Uh, but you can pretty much pay for something and walk away with it the same day. Now, there is the second universe of firearms, uh, and that uh, includes machine guns and silencers, uh, short-barreled rifles, short-barreled shotguns, destructive devices, a couple of other uh, types of firearms, and they are regulated by a federal law called the National Firearms Act of 1934. And so these items cannot just be purchased over the counter from a dealer without going through some bureaucratic rigmarole. Uh, this goes back to 1934 when the Congress passed the National Firearms Act as the first major gun control legislation at the federal level in the United States. And it supposedly was uh, designed to target gangster weapons. They had seen the Valentine's Day massacre years before and all the evils of prohibition that they thought were the evils of guns, I guess. We as libertarians know better thanks to the scholarship of folks like Mark Thornton and others. Uh, but anyway, uh, this National Firearms Act targeted these gangster weapons, but back then federal lawmakers didn't really think that they had the authority to outright ban things. And you may remember that the first anti-drug law at the federal level, at least anti, the first anti-marijuana law was the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, not the Marijuana Prohibition of 1937. And so a few years before 1934, it was a similar uh, law that was enacted relating to these more heavily regulated firearms. And so they imposed an excise tax on the making or the transfer of these items. Uh, for most of them, it was $200. Uh, I believe actually for all of them, it was initially $200, then they tinkered a bit later. For most things, it's still $200 today. Now, in 1934, that would have been an effective prohibition on these items because, again, the average salary in that year, I think, was around $1,300. But thanks to our friends at the Federal Reserve uh, and monetary inflation, the tax has become more of an annoyance, not so much of a total stopper in terms of people being able to enter into these transactions and acquire these items or make them. Uh, so... In the last decade in particular, the silencer industry has really taken off, is really growing rapidly. Uh, and short-barreled rifles, probably a, a close second in terms of popularity. Now, I would mention just as some context when we're talking about this federal agency, the ATF. Uh, remember, repeal of the Volstead Act was, was just a few months before this was passed, I believe in, in 1933, right? And so 1934, six months later, the Bureau of Prohibition is being transitioned over from being this prohibition agency, there's the name, right, uh, to an agency that was going to regulate alcohol and then tobacco and firearms. Um, and so now what we know is the Bureau, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, or the Bureau of All Things Fun and Exciting, 
uh, came from that old Bureau of Prohibition, and it should be no surprise that some of that agency culture came with it. Now, for those of you who are reading at home, uh, you can find the National Firearms Act in 26 U.S.C. Chapter 53. That's 26 U.S. Code Chapter 53. So what the NFA does, or Title II of the Federal Firearms Law uh, does, is, as I said, it imposes an excise tax on the making or the transfer of these more regulated items. And it imposes a regular, uh, excuse me, a registration requirement. And so uh, that pertains to machine guns, any gun that can uh, fire more than one round per trigger pull, uh, silencers, any device that's designed to silence or muffle the report of a firearm. Uh, by the way, uh, one of the major uh, initial designers in this industry, uh, Hiram Percy Maxim, also the guy who innovated the car muffler and really this doing the same thing to expansion chamber to uh, slow down those gases before they burst out of the muzzle of the firearm. So then we got short barreled rifles, rifles with a barrel shorter than 16 inches in length, or if, if the weapon overall is less than 26 inches. Uh, and then short barreled shotguns, a shotgun with a barrel of less than 18 inches uh, or an overall length of less than 26 inches. Uh, destructive devices uh, include a lot of different types of explo uh, explosives or incendiary devices, uh, rockets with a propellant charge of more than four ounces, a lot of other things listed there. You can read all that. And then there's this catch-all category, any other weapon. And that includes uh, smoothbore handguns. It includes disguised weapons uh, or hidden weapons. Uh, and you can, again, read more about what fits into that category. But again, there's this tax and registration requirement. And these uh, items can be registered to natural persons, real live human beings, or they can be registered to trusts uh, or partnerships or corporations, estates, uh, various types of associations. And there are differences in the regulatory requirements based on what type of entity or what type of person is registering the item. And so now we get to trusts. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me explain the first advantage of using a trust, and I'll talk a little bit about what a trust is. But uh, when you use a trust, you basically get to skip a few steps uh, in terms of application requirements that are expected uh, of the individual applicant. An individual applicant has to get fingerprint cards made up, has to get passport style photos, uh, and has to get a signature from a chief local law enforcement official. And what that amounts to, I would say, is a violation of equal protection if we want to speak in legal terms because the local law enforcement bureaucrat can arbitrarily just refuse to sign and they don't have a legal duty to sign because they're not a federal employee they're, the federal government isn't going to compel them to sign the paperwork uh and so as a result it's sort of arbitrary uh some folks are anti-gun don't like the idea of this stuff around and so they won't sign uh, most rural law enforcement will sign. And so based on your zip code, based on your local legal jurisdiction, this stuff may or may not be accessible to the individual because the individual may not be able to complete the application process. So that's why a lot of people use a trust because a trust allows you to skip the fingerprinting, the photographs, and that local uh, law enforcement sign off. Uh, and so that's why most people come to me uh, to, ha to help set up a gun trust for them is because they're trying to avoid uncooperative local law enforcement, or maybe it's just a convenience factor. They don't want to do all that running around. So what is a trust? Uh, first off, I'll tell you what a trust isn't. A trust is not a contract. A trust is not a corporation. It's not a will. It's not an agency relationship. It's not a bailment. It's not actually an entity at all. Uh, a trust is a relationship as to property where legal ownership is divided from beneficial ownership. It goes back uh, to the courts in equity uh, and a couple of the dictionary definitions, the right enforceable solely in equity to the beneficial enjoyment of property to which another person holds the legal title, a property interest held by one person, the trustee at the request of another, the set law for the benefit of a third party, the beneficiary. That's from Black's Law Dictionary, seventh edition. So. The, probably the easiest illustration uh, goes back to historical uses. Uh, the, some of the precursors of the trust, the fidi commissum, excuse my Latin pronunciation there, was a Roman customary practice, uh, started circa 200 BC, and property was committed to someone's care upon the previous owner's death to be distributed. And so it, it was an estate planning vehicle, uh, which is not a surprise given what many people use it for today. 
uh, but among other advantages, it enabled property to be distributed after death to people who were not the property owner's legal heirs. And so that allowed them to avoid government restrictions uh, as to who could inherit. Um, the person to whom property was entrusted in this way was often an heir himself. Uh, and originally it was only enforceable in sort of an honor system uh, by social ostracism. Later it was incorporated into the Roman civil code. The Germanic Salmanus uh, in circa 520 AD is a similar construct. The uh, Islamic uh, legal scholars developed something called the Waqf in uh, around 700 AD. Uh, and in fact, the Temple Mount today is managed by, uh, by this sort of quasi-trust uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem. So the immediate precursor to the trust was the English use. It was a managed for, uh, excuse me, a method for managing feudal estates uh, that avoided the complications of legal tenancy. And during the 12th century, uh, it basically allowed absentee property owners to provide for the administration of their property and allowed them to grant authority to people who could manage it on their behalf. Uh, and this gave rise to the trust. Uh, and a very common uh, example that I use for clients because it's nice and vivid is imagine uh the lord of the manor going off to fight in the crusades and somebody has to run the manor while he's not there but he can't just hand over the keys because you know they might uh self-deal they might just use the property to their benefit and maybe not use it for the benefit of the family uh or of the the line or whatever and so in equity this person could be bound to have these equitable duties that they had to use their legal ownership authority uh to execute and so to carry out. Uh, one example of how the, the use was utilized, going back a few steps before the trust, is Franciscan friars who wanted to circumvent their order's prohibition on the personal ownership of real property. And so they would uh, assign that property to a use, enjoy the benefit of the property, but not technically violate their vow. Now, what does a typical trust look like? Uh, from A to B, or C for life, and then to D. So from a settlor, a person who settles the trust, creates the trust, to a trustee, someone who's gonna act like the legal owner, for the benefit, usually, of a life beneficiary, and then after that life beneficiary dies, then to a remainderman beneficiary, to someone who gets what remains after the life benefit has been extinguished. And so A, B, for C for life, and then to D. So the settlor is a person who makes a settlement of property, sets up a trust. Sometimes they're called the grantor, the trustor, or the founder. Those are all synonyms for our purposes in trust law. Uh, the settlor contributes the initial property to fund the trust and creates the trust and sets out its purposes. Uh, the trustee holds legal title to the property, and we might say he's the legal owner, but he has a, an, an equitable duty that, to manage that property for the benefit of the beneficiaries. And there are all these uh, duties that the trustee has that he can't engage in self-dealing. He can't engage uh, in improper management of the, of the estate property. Uh, and so the trustee in carrying out those duties ultimately gets that property on to the, to, after the life beneficiary anyway, gets it on to that remainder beneficiary, make sure that they ultimately end up with it in accordance with the wishes of the settlor. So trusts are super flexible. Uh, I already gave you a couple examples of what they might be used for, had been used historically for. Uh, but modern applications include spendthrift trusts, uh, family trusts, charitable trusts, unit trusts, uh, which are used to structure collective investment vehicles, uh, once upon a time, now mostly obsolete. Uh, there are pension plan trusts, remuneration trusts, corporate trusts, asset protection trusts, tax planning trusts, uh, co-ownership trusts, construction trusts, and then trust designed for the registration of items regulated by the National Firearms Act. So the typical process for using a trust to register your NFA items. Uh, some people find a form on the internet. Uh, some folks call me or contact another attorney uh, to go over their needs and then have that attorney draft the documents. But ultimately, this is an estate planning vehicle. Uh, a lot of provisions in a gun trust wouldn't be suitable for a general estate planning vehicle, but for this type of property, uh, it is uh, suitable, for example, the trustee might be able to use the property in a gun trust, certainly wouldn't want the trustee to be able to use the property and diminish its value in other types of trusts. Uh, 
But you'd correspond with the attorney, get the trust documents drafted, you'd execute those documents. That's the first ingredient to make this cake. And the second ingredient is to fund the trust. So you express the intent to create the trust by executing documents, and then you fund the trust by contributing some property of value to it. Uh, in, in most states, uh, and in Nebraska, where I practice, uh, that gives you a valid trust. So at that point, you have all the documents that you need, more or less, to support an application to the ATF to make or to transfer one of these NFA items. And then there is a long, long wait. The NFA branch of the ATF uh, currently takes, I think, about six or seven months uh, to process most paperwork. Uh, and that's actually down from an 11 month wait uh, this, uh, this time last year. And so uh, it's, it's quite a long time to wait. There, uh, the high time preference liquor store robbers are probably not going to go through this process uh, to acquire their, uh, their firearms. Uh, but if you have the patience to pay money up front and have your property sit in a safe for six months, then you can go through this bureaucratic process in the United States anyway to get these items. So, uh, and Ultimately, what happens is once the application is approved, a stamp is affixed to that front of, to the front of that application. It's canceled. It's a tax stamp, uh, and then that's sent back to the transferor, the person who's transferring that item to the buyer or whoever. And that's uh, that's the proof that that buyer can legally be in possession of it. So, I already mentioned some of the the process benefits of using a trust in terms of the application being easier. They also enable, <coughs> excuse me, co-ownership. The fact is that uh, if you, uh, or excuse me, if, if someone gets a silencer or a machine gun or what have you, other people can use that item. Other people who aren't prohibited persons, uh, convicted felons, a whole bunch of other folks who are prohibited under federal law and state law from possessing firearms. If you aren't a prohibited person, you can use your buddy's silencer or use the machine gun while he's physically present. It happens all the time. There are big machine gun shoots, lots of federal law enforcement present. It's not a big deal because the registered owner is right there. But if you wanted to send your hunting buddy over to the other side of the section to hunt with your can on the end of his gun, uh, now that's an unlawful transfer if that's an individual registration. Uh, but if that item is registered to a trust, you can have that person authorized as a co-trustee. And now, even if you're not physically present, he can possess and use that property uh, and do it lawfully. Uh, also, for spouses in particular or roommates, uh, there's an issue of constructive possession. If that person has access to a gun safe while the registered owner uh, is gone, that might be considered constructive possession, meaning that they could be accused of being in possession of an NFA item that's not registered to them, which is, carries a very serious criminal penalty, years in federal prison, hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. And so we can avoid that gray area and not be at some bureaucrat's discretion by having trustees who are authorized to to possess these items as well. So a pretty big benefit there, just being able to make more people uh, authorized to possess and use the trust property. Finally, there's just the <coughs> estate planning benefits. The fact is, I, I listed off to you a bunch of different categories of NFA items, but I like to say there's only two types of NFA items. There's stuff that people swear up and down is illegal, like silencers and machine guns, and people uh, and stuff that people, even guys that like guns, might look at and not recognize are subject to additional paperwork requirements, like short-barreled rifles. Uh, an example might be an M4 carbine with a 14 and a half inch barrel, but with a flash hider that's threaded on instead of pinned, pinned and welded. And so that uh, would be an NFA item subject to registration, uh, subject to a transfer tax in, in many cases. Uh, and so we want to leave really clear guidance to people who are going to be around after the original buyer is dead and gone, so that those expensive assets make it on to the uh, to the beneficiaries at a minimum of expense and according to the wishes of the of the settlor. So uh, there are some drawbacks. One is that a transfer from a trust is typically going to be taxable, whereas a transfer from an estate uh, will transfer tax free on a form five. So that's an additional one time expense associated uh, with the transfer of those items. Uh, on to the beneficiaries from a trust wouldn't happen with an inheritance. Uh, again, folks have to individually weigh what's most important to them. I think a lot of folks find that the benefits outweigh the costs. Uh, and then, of course, there's an additional one-time expense of having a special purpose trust drafted. Now, there's something called the eForms system uh, that ATF rolled out. Oh, boy. I think it was the beginning of the year. It might have been the end of last year. 
No, yeah, it was into the summer in 2013. And what it allowed is electronic filing of a lot of these forms to, uh, to apply to transfer to make an NFA item. Now, the e-form system went down in April of this year, and they only partially brought it back. So currently it's paper applications only for us mere mortals, non-federal firearms licensees, except for making NFA items. Those can still be done uh, via the e-form system. It's actually quite fast. Uh, there is a proposal from ATF to uh, impose those individual application requirements, the fingerprinting, the photographing, the chief local law enforcement sign off on trust applicants as well. That's called ATF 41P. There's some information on that at silencernews.com. Uh, other than that, you know, if we think about this, and I see in the comments, somebody's kind of talking about this a little bit. A silencer, it's a muffler for your gun. It's required equipment by law in every jurisdiction that I know of, certainly every first world jurisdiction. It's required to have a muffler on your car. But if I want to moderate the loud concussive sound of a firearm, for some reason I have to jump through all this, you know, all these hoops, these bureaucratic hoops. And again, it's because of this sort of mythology that's developed in, you know, we want to call it comic books. I don't know, maybe too many people were reading the Dick Tracy stuff during Prohibition and thought silencers could do things that they couldn't. Uh, but they do, they, while well, they moderate the sound uh, of a firearm, and in many cases bring it down to hearing safe levels, they don't make firearms silent, okay? So the difference is you don't have to wear a set of these in every circumstance anyway. Certainly with a suppressed 22 rifle like this, um, it is uh, hearing safe. Excuse me, I'm not sure about the, the focus there. Okay, so this is a suppressed Ruger uh, 1022 takedown, and especially with subsonic ammo, uh, for example, this Ely stuff, uh, it's, it's really quite, quite quiet. It's not silent, but it's, uh, certainly hearing safe. Uh, other aspects might be just the mundane use of throwing a silencer on your, uh, standard home defense firearm. This is a Beretta model 92, uh, with a silencer cost by 45 with the proper piston to put it on the nine millimeter. And, you know, in a home defense situation, uh, it's really important to maintain situational, maintain situational awareness. And whether it's from the muzzle flash or from that loud concussion in an enclosed space in a hallway when you're encountering uh, an intruder, a silencer can really be an advantage, can take away some of the detriment of discharging a firearm indoors. And so I think there really is a home defense application. Uh, this is, you know, my nightstand gun. Then, uh, you know, other than that, another application for silencers might be for hunting. Uh, this is a rifle that's kind of set up for varminting. Uh, it's got a hundred town Kestrel 556 suppressor on it. And uh, you know, it's something where you can make it safer for the user. You can reduce the report so you're not scaring game away, maybe a couple hundred yards away like you would with the full decibel level that you get out of an unsuppressed firearm. And you can talk to your buddy easier while you're on the line shooting. Uh, and as some people are mentioning in the comments, it's sort of a matter of being polite. Now, uh, some of the other items that that uh, you might get, like say it would be uh, a smoothbore handgun or classified as an, any other weapon. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, sort of a short barreled shotgun, except it's not actually classified as a short barrel shotgun. And the reason for that is that this item uh, this firearm never had a shoulder stock on it. And so because it was not originally designed to fire from the shoulder, because it was pistol grip only, it's a smoothbore handgun subject to only a $5 transfer tax instead of being a smooth, excuse me, instead of being a short barreled shotgun, uh, which would be subject to a $200 transfer tax and is also subject to restrictions on interstate transport that the AOWs and silencers are not. Uh, other items might be uh, like, for example, a short barreled rifle. Uh, this is a short-barreled AR-15, currently chambered in 5.56, or a uh, Kel-Tec PLR-16 that's been converted into a, a short-barreled rifle, also uh, chambered in 5.56. And so, you know, those are some of the things that, that are regulated by the NFA and that people are using trusts to acquire. Now, as I mentioned, uh, far and away silencers, the most popular segment of this market about 75 percent of nfa transfers are relating to a silencer uh, 
Silencer Co. in Utah, sort of one of the hot companies. Again, they're the manufacturer of the of the Osprey here, and that's uh, you know. Silencer Co. in Utah is one of Inc. Magazine's fastest growing companies uh, on one of those lists that that magazine puts out. There's tens of thousands of NFA transfer applications in process at any given time. Uh, 39 states allow the private ownership of silencers. Uh, about 30 states uh, allow hunting with silencers. Uh, Florida administratively uh, just removed the prohibition on hunting with silencers. Uh, so as I said, there's a $200 transfer tax or making tax on most of these items. There's a registration requirement, but really, if your state doesn't prohibit these items, anybody who can understand, excuse me, anybody who can legally acquire a handgun under federal law would legally be able to get these items. Uh, I see a comment uh, from somebody about short-barreled rifles, and I'd say that uh, its maneuverability is, major, is maybe a major benefit. You lose a lot of velocity when you cut a barrel that short, but also if you're going to suppress it, uh, then it maybe makes some sense to do that. I lose video here. Oh, there we are. So anyway, uh, further resources that you can look at before I take it out to questions, Matt. Uh, you can look at the National Firearms Act Handbook, which is a publication of the ATF that's pretty close to being in real English <laughs> to explain the ins and outs of that uh, part of the federal law. Uh, for trusts, I recommend Loring and Rounds, a trustee's handbook. Uh, and then for current wait times and uh, current trends on how long transfers are taking, check out great website, nfatracker.com. Finally, my website, which is sadly not very frequently updated, is silencernews.com, and there are some resources there, especially about that uh, ATF 41P uh, regulatory proposal. So with that, I will throw it out for questions. All right, we've already got our first question here from Joseph. Um, Thoughts on bump fire stocks? I own one and it's nice. <laughs> well, uh, as with full auto, they can turn a semi-automatic firearm into a bullet hose. And that means sending lots of dollars downrange, but uh, I'm sure they can be fun. I have not used uh, the bump fire stocks, uh, especially the newer ones that have come out in the last couple of years. Uh, I've seen enough videos to see there are a, lot of, a whole lot of people who can use them effectively. Uh, Again, I I don't see the use case other than just sort of pure fun sort of fireworks type stuff, but I'm glad that they're out there and I'm glad that uh, ATF in its wisdom has not seen fit to classify them as machine guns. I don't think that'll change anytime soon. So, Manuel asks, is there a disadvantage to adding a regular GCA firearm to an NFA trust? Okay. Hi, Manuel. Uh, so GCA, uh, he's referring to the Gun Control Act of 1968, sometimes called Title I of the Federal Firearms Law. And that would just mean, you know, pistols, rifles, and shotguns, pretty much. And there could be a disadvantage to adding it to a trust, depending on how your trust is drafted. If a trust uses what's called a Schedule A, or Schedule of Assets, where that's incorporated by reference into the trust agreement, that becomes something that has to go to ATF to support the application to transfer the item to the trust. And so if you have your GCA firearms uh, that have been assigned to the trust, that's going to be in the documents that go to the ATF. And so unless you like the idea of sending a list of all your guns to the federal government, probably not a good idea to tr transfer your GCA firearms into that sort of trust. Now, the trust that I draft for folks and that a lot of other folks uh, use use what's called an assignment sheet. And that would only list one, uh, well, it could list more than one, but typically it would only list one particular firearm. And typically it's just gonna be the firearm that's subject to that application paperwork that's going to ATF. So that preserves privacy a little better. And if your trust is set up that way, it's uh, more likely that your trust is suited for non-NFA firearms or GCA firearms as well. You need to consult an attorney in your jurisdiction to get the final answer on that one, Manuel. Our next question is from Tyler. Tyler asks, do you see guns and accessories getting cheaper in the future, and how could they? Well, you know, I think we are seeing them get cheaper right now. And in fact, AR-15s today, uh, you know, if you go back to right after Sandy Hook not that long ago, an AR-15 today costs, you know, maybe 60% uh, of what you know, your standard AR-15 was going for during that scare. And so I think a whole lot of people got tooled up 
uh, not just for that reason, but for other reasons, building AR-15s. And I think now we see a glut of AR-15 parts on the market. I saw a Cyber Monday special of an AR-15 strip lower receiver from Anderson Arms for $35. They were going for like $120, uh, you know, or more. Uh, not even during the panic, just typically on store shelves. Uh, and now you see those regularly for 60 or $70 uh, for sure. And so I think we already see a lot of stuff a lot cheaper just because <clears throat> a whole bunch of people rushed in, a bunch of people figured out it was a bad idea. There's been some market consolidation. There's some consolidation going on right now, but we're seeing prices fall as a result uh, of, of that expansion of capacity, I think. Uh, as far as accessories getting cheaper in the future, you know, I mean, maybe home fabrication and 3D printing uh, might play a role for that. As far as metal components, uh, you know, direct, what is it, direct metal laser centering or whatever additive uh, production, you know, additive printing is for uh, metal. That's a little beyond our home budgets right now, I think. And so I'm not sure that's going to drive the price down a whole lot, although they have made some op operational firearms using that process. Uh, but other than that, I think it'll be good old fashioned competition and innovation and people coming up with the, the new toy that people have to have. You know, a few years ago, everybody wanted the quad rail four end with all your accessory mounting positions. And now people like a slimmer design. And so there's style and fashion in guns, just like uh, maybe any other part of the market. that's not a pure commodity market. So uh, next question. Uh, what are your thoughts on... 3D printed weapons, and what's the law now on those? Because I, even as a, a lawyer, I have no idea. Uh, and where do you think it's going? Well, so hopefully we're all familiar with the Defense Distributed uh, big unveiling of the Liberator, which was, I believe, a 380 ACP uh, single shot pistol that was 3D printed. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what the plastic uh, media was that was used to print it. But anyway, it survived uh, at least one firing. Uh, and with, I believe the application of some acetone, uh, they were able to get it to be a little more durable uh, than just straight off the, uh, the printer. I question whether that gun was a legal firearm under the NFA. And I'll tell you why, because my understanding is that the barrel was not rifled. And so that would mean it was a smooth bore handgun, which probably makes it an AOW or any other weapon under the NFA. I know that subsequent designs, uh, I think from out in the community, uh, did feature a rifled barrel. And so I think those would technically pass muster as a legal handgun. Uh, generally, though, uh, as far as making guns at home from any materials, whether it's 3D printing media or uh, making a zip gun out of, out of pipe, you can legally make, at least in most states and under federal law, you can legally make firearms at home, okay? And uh, as long as they are not firearms that would be subject to the NFA, so long as they would be classified as pistols, rifles, or shotguns, then you can make those at home. Uh, they don't have to be marked like a maker would have to mark them if he were making them commercially. Um, and so uh, there is still some freedom to operate there. Now, I'm a big believer in the division of labor. And I like it when other people make my guns because there are explosions happening inside of that device. And so to me, I, I, I'm a tinkerer to some extent, but I'm not a tinkerer to the extent of like wanting to put my hand or my eyeballs on the line. You know, I like safe machinery when there are explosions involved. So maybe not for me. Of course, there's a big market for 80% uh, lower receivers where you can get a lower receiver that's only 80% complete, totally arbitrary designation, but ATF has certain guidelines as to what constitutes less than 80% complete. And you can mill those out the rest of the way. And actually, Cody Wilson, I believe that's his name, right, from Defense Distributed, uh, just came out with the Ghost Gunner, which hasn't hit full production yet from what I understand. But that's a, a desktop milling operation that can mill your 80% uh, your eighty percent lower into a finished uh, or at least a milled stripped lower receiver that you can then assemble into a firearm. So uh, something that's legal in most jurisdictions. Uh, I, I see another question here asking about the new stock made for pistol style air 15s. Now I'll correct you, Joseph 51494, because it's not a stock, sir. And that's, what's interesting about this. What he's talking about is the SIG arm brace. And so it looks like a stock. And if one didn't know better, 
then one might be tempted to lift this contraption to his shoulder and shoulder it as if it were a shoulder stock. However, this is a device that was designed for disabled veterans to, uh, who don't have all the hand strength of somebody who isn't disabled. And it allows you to brace the rifle, or excuse me, the pistol, on your arm. And of course, since it's a pistol, it can have a barrel that's shorter than 16 inches. Uh, now, again, this is a pistol because it's not a firearm that's originally designed to be fired with one hand with a barrel of less than 16 inches, okay? And so, right, yeah. So I, I think I got that out right. So anyway, it, it, putting this on, I've heard that some people might be putting it to an off-label use of actually shouldering the firearm and effectively having what looks like a short-barreled rifle without having to go through the tax stamp and you know approval process. Uh, it's still legal. Uh, there is a letter that came out advising the company, SIG, which is no slouch. I'm sure they've got a legal department and they've got, you know, it's high stakes for them. They're a big established player. They've got a letter saying they can go ahead and distribute this product. So uh, if you want to get it, go ahead. Uh, certainly a pistol uh, wouldn't be subject to the, the same interstate transport uh, restrictions that a short-barreled rifle is. Uh, for machine guns, short-barreled rifles, short-barreled shotguns, you have to get an ATF Form 20 approved before you transport it interstate. So maybe an advantage there for some folks. I'm going to put out a call for more questions and let people know what's going on this week at Liberty Me Live. We've got a couple of daytime sessions this week. Uh, tomorrow we've got former member of the European Parliament, uh, Godfrey Bloom. He's going to be talking about his new book, uh, a Dinosaur's Guide to Libertarianism. That's going to be at 3 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. And Godfrey is uh, always at least entertaining, um, if not enlightening. If you've uh, ever watched any of his speeches or, or, or met him, he's always entertaining. Uh, Wednesday we've got uh, Jake DeSillis, who wrote uh, Our Liberty Guide, uh, the art, uh, let's see, uh, Negotiating for Mutual Profit, that was it. Uh, and he's got a book called Becoming an Entrepreneur. He's going to be talking about that on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Uh, Thursday, we've got one that I'm really excited about. We've got Butler Schaefer, uh, who's going to be here for four sessions across December and January. His first session is Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. He's going to be talking about all, all the topic of his book, uh, Calculated Chaos and Institutional Threats to uh, Peace and uh, I believe Human Flourishing. So he, he's going to be talking about that. If you're not familiar with Butler, he is a legend in the movement. He taught at Rampart College with uh, Bob Lefebvre. He knew Rothbard pretty well. He's He knows his stuff, and he's fascinating to listen to. He, he We were on Skype the other day, and he was telling stories. And I was like, I have the best job in the world. It was awesome. But definitely check that out Thursday night at 8, and then at uh, 9.30 that night, we've got uh, the continuation of Zach Slayback's series on Love, Hate, and the State, an Introduction to the Moral Psychology of Politics. So it's going to be a fun week here this week. We've got David Friedman, Dan D'Amico, uh, and Zach Goschenauer next week, among others. Uh, so definitely check it out. Hope to see you all back. Uh, Joseph notes something interesting here in the comments. I think yeah, I, while you were talking about... Uh, Cody Wilson and the Liberator. He said, interesting thing about the name, there was a pistol of the same name that was made to be dropped behind the lines for resistance fighters during World War II. By the end of the war, they were making them faster than one could be shot. I think uh, hopefully we, we won't have to uh, create those for resistance fighters, uh, the, the, the 3D printed ones, anytime soon. I, I don't look forward to any sort of revolutionary action but it's comforting to know that we could that's right although you know in the united states we've got more guns than we have people as far as i can tell and so uh if if we're not able to defend ourselves against tyrannical government should the need arise it won't be because of lack of guns uh <laughs> at least not in the united states uh i know a lot of folks in other places uh get mad at us yanks as they call us although i resent that as a southerner originally but uh, they get mad at us because we get to show off all these fun toys and we can get anything, or so they think. But uh, we do have it better uh, in the U.S. in that regard than in a lot of places. Uh, and so this is an area where, you know, if you live in a friendly jurisdiction uh, and you have the interest, go ahead and, and get started. Uh, because I suspect the laws are not going to get any better at the federal level. 
uh, although we are seeing some, you know, some real improvement at the state level in a lot of ways. So. Yeah, I know uh, there have been some some improvements in my state of North Carolina that uh, we can carry in bars and stuff now, I believe, and some in other interesting stuff. Uh, actually, uh, originally introduced to the legislature here by a friend of mine, Glenn Bradley, who's oh. uh, worked on the Ron Paul campaign. Oh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I was out in uh, I was out in North Carolina a couple months ago talking about tax relief so or learning from the wizened old hands uh, out there about tax relief uh, trying to get some of that in Nebraska but I digress so well thanks uh, okay. so much for I, I tell you what one last comment and then I'll uh, I'll let you sign off sorry to cut you off there I see Joseph talking about this suppressor versus silencer well with all due respect, that's sort of like complaining about people calling a tissue a Kleenex. Uh, Silencer was a trade name used by Hiram Percy Maxim to promote his product. Uh, and it was such a successful promotion tool that it came to be synonymous with the name of the product itself, the general use name of the product. And so uh, for that reason, I'm happy to go ahead and call a Coke a Coke and a Silencer a Silencer. Uh, even though you're quite right, that's a marketing term. It doesn't literally silence the firearm. Uh, you still have with supersonic ammo, a supersonic crack, you still have some muzzle blast, you still have mechanical noise, uh, but I'm still going to, you know, be happy with my silencernews.com domain registration instead of suppressornews.com, so one final plug for that. Thanks again, uh, Matt, for giving me the opportunity to talk tonight. Absolutely. We hope to have you back sometime soon. Everybody, make sure you check out silencernews.com and also check out uh, Dick's two guides. Uh, if you scroll up in chat, they're all the way at the top. Uh, how to buy your first handgun and building an armory from scratch. We've gotten a lot of good comments on those. People have found those useful, so hope you do too. Thanks everyone for coming tonight, and thanks Dick for being with us. Take care everyone, and have a great night. We'll see you here tomorrow back on Liberty Me Live. Have a good night.